In physics, it's often important to find out how fast something is travelling. To do that, we need to take two measurements. If we take my toy car here, first of all, we need to know the distance it has travelled and then the time it has taken to go from A to B. And then we can find out how fast it is travelling. Finding out our speed when we travel is important to all kinds of people. Stella, I want to know how fast I'm going on my bike. And I'd like to know how fast I can go on my ski. Because I'm sure I can go faster than him. Yeah, but the trouble is our speeds are changing all the time. So what's the easiest way to measure it? Well, you could just buy one of those bike computers. Can't afford it. And how would I fit one of those on my skates? Any ideas, Stella? OK, let me think about it. I'd better get my skates on for this one. I think we should look at exactly what speed is. Now, our speed tells us the distance we've travelled in a certain time. And the faster the speed, the more ground we cover each second. So, to be able to work out our speed, we need to know the distance we've travelled and the time taken to cover that distance. What I want to find out is how the police know someone's speeding. After all, they can't be sitting in their car with them, watching their speedometer. So how do they work the speed out? For this investigation, I'm off to see Tom Matheson, who's very interested in the speed of car lorries, particularly if they're breaking the limit. <laughs> Tom, why is it you're so interested in the speeds that cars travel? The most important one is the safety of road users, be they car drivers or pedestrians. The faster a vehicle is going, the more injury it's going to cause if it comes into a contact with a pedestrian, for example. But how can you tell if a car's speeding? Would you just guess? Oh, no, no, we don't guess. I, I have a, several uh, methods open to me. I have a speed gun, I have a fixed cameras at the side of the road, and we have a time and distance computer. To calculate the speed of a car, Tom needs two measurements, a distance the car has travelled and the time it took to cover that distance. Tom can use the computer to measure the distance between these markings on the road and under the shadow of the bridge. And then all he has to do is time how long it takes a car to travel between the two marks. Dividing the distance by the time gives him the car's speed. OK, we're going to uh, measure the distance now, Femi, between the paint marks on the road and the shadow of the railway bridge. Okay. So if you start the uh, orange button there when we come to the marks and turn it off when we come to the shadow of the bridge. All right. So this computer is a bit like a measuring wheel, then? That's right. It's just measuring the distance. Here we are. Start it now. Start it. OK, get ready. And as soon as I tell you, turn it off. Turn it off now. OK. And that distance is 105. Excellent. The police have found that this sort of distance, 0.105 of a mile, about a tenth of a mile, is long enough to give them an accurate indication of a car's average speed. Now all we hark up and wait for a likely candidate. We've put in 105, which is the distance measurement, and now on this side we're going to use the stopwatch side of it and we're going to time the vehicles travelling between the white paint marks and the bridge. Black car on the outside lane. I don't think it's going that fast. Let's no, see. Nor do I. Here we go. Up to the shadow, that's it. Now to get the speed, all I have to do is divide the distance by the time the car takes to cover it. Luckily the computer does that for me. 49.93. Oh, you were lucky. <laughs> Just, Just within the limit by 0.7 of a mile away. You an hour. were lucky. The speed of a moving object is calculated using the formula speed equals distance travelled over time. The usual unit of speed is the metre per second. So if this toy car travels 24 metres in 3 seconds, what is its speed? We need to use our distance travelled over time calculation. So, the answer to the question, what is its speed? If this toy car travels 24 metres in 3 seconds, to calculate the speed, we need the formula distance travelled over time. 
So 24 meters divided by 3 seconds means we have an answer of 8 meters per second. Now, if you weren't sure of this calculation, there are some more test questions on the website, so check it out. The different forces can be confusing, but keep watching as we're going to run through them in a logical order to understand the different types and what each one is doing. This section is going to look at balanced and unbalanced forces. Let's look at balanced forces first. See these books on the table? Don't look like they're doing much, but the weight of the books is pushing down on the table. And that's not all. The table's also pushing back on the books. Imagine what would happen if it didn't. Even these comfy cushions can push back on me. Watch what happens as I sit down. Let's look at that again. At first, my weight is a bigger force than the upward force of the springs, so I go down. But the more squash the springs get, the more they push back. Eventually, the force pushing back equals my weight. The forces in each direction balance, and I stay put. It's called equilibrium. So the forces on me as I sit here are balanced. The force I exert on the bench is the same as the force the bench has pushing up. But objects don't have to be stationary to have balanced forces acting on them. An object that moves in a straight line at a constant speed also has balanced forces acting on it. Each force is cancelled out by an equal and opposite force. But if I stop this object from moving, or get up off this bench, then unbalanced forces are being exerted. Johnny, are you used to pulling large weights around? Yes, in the wooden competition and the strongman competitions, we can pull barges, buses, big fire engines, ships, even aeroplanes. Excellent. Well, I've got a dinky little carriage for you out there to pull. You don't mind, do you? No, not at all. Excellent. But how am I going to measure the kind of force you're exerting to get the carriage going? Well, I've got a force meter here. So we can attach this onto my harness and attach it onto the truck, and we'll be able to measure the force. Excellent. Um, let's get your harness up, then. OK. Go! Now, if I convert the reading on the forceometer into metric units, I can see that Jamie needed a force of four and a half kilonewtons. That's four and a half thousand newtons to start the carriage moving. Well, he doesn't seem to need as much to keep it moving. Stop! But how much force would he need to stop it? Jamie! Awesome or what? Amazing. Now, you obviously had to exert an awful lot of force to get the carriage started. It's always difficult, something like this, because you have to overcome friction and unbalance the forces, but once it's actually moving, it's just a constant force to keep it moving. So, to get the dray to move, Jamie had to unbalance the forces acting on it. As it starts to move, it's accelerating, or rather being accelerated by Jamie pulling with the force greater than friction. But once the carriage was moving, it became a lot easier because all he had to do to keep a constant speed was to balance the forces acting on the dray. But to slow down and stop the carriage, once again required unbalanced forces. So remember, stationary or moving at a constant speed and direction, the forces on an object are balanced. An object that starts moving, slows down or changes direction has unbalanced forces acting on it. If you are asked a question about forces, it is easier if you can identify the forces and the direction in which they're acting. I find remembering formulas and things like that and equations very hard because unless you have knowledge and understanding of the subject, to just remember an equation is quite difficult. When putting arrows on forces diagrams, make sure that you have the arrow facing in the correct direction. For friction and air resistance, the arrow should be in the opposite direction to the movement. For gravity, always make sure the arrow is facing towards the centre of the Earth.
So for balanced and unbalanced forces, you really need to know and understand these definitions. When the forces acting on an object are balanced, the object is either stationary or moving at a constant speed or direction. When the forces acting on an object are unbalanced, they will cause the object to either change shape, change its speed or change its direction. This brings us to the end of the section on balanced and unbalanced. We're now going to move on to look at different types of forces. We're now going to look at three important forces in action you need to know well. Number one, the gravitational pull on our mass. Two, the effects of friction. And three, the effects of air resistance. First, gravity. This is the force that acts on all objects because of the gravitational attraction between them and the Earth. The two other forces are not so obvious, so we need to take a closer look at them. We're a bit stuck on something. Yeah, we're all on this wooden floor, but some of us can slide around and some can't. It's because my trainers have got rubber soles. They're stickier than your leather ones. I reckon it's got something to do with forces and weights. No, we all weigh about the same. I can slide around easily. You can't start it. Why is that, Stella? OK, leave it with me. We're not dealing with sticky things here. We're dealing with forces. Look at this block. If I push it along here, I'm exerting a force on it and it moves. But if I also push from the other side with an equal force, it doesn't move. The forces are balanced. If the forces acting against an object are balanced, then there's no movement. So, if you're wearing trainers and really trying to push your foot along the ground and failing, it must be because there's an equal force acting against the foot in the other direction. And this force is called friction. So, friction is the force that opposes movement when two circles try to slide over each other. And one of the things that the size of that frictional force depends on is what the surfaces are made of. So friction is our second force in action. It's the force that resists the motion of an object and slows it down. Friction is created whenever two touching objects or surfaces move past each other. So we've had gravity and we've had friction, so what's the third force? Cycling. You can't beat it. But I'm off to see someone who can make me go faster without me doing any training. So, Joss, how can you make me go faster? Well, when you cycle, you can feel the wind on your face. That's the force of the air pushing against you. So if we can reduce the force of the air, you'll go faster. Excellent. Thank you. I'm in a wind tunnel, so rather than me pushing through the air, the air's going to be pushing through. Joss Darling is an expert in how air flows against solid objects. It's called aerodynamics. The giant fan is set to make the air travel at 25 miles an hour, the equivalent of a windy day. The moving air forces me backwards. The force is called air resistance, or drag. This apparatus measures the drag. It is linked to Joss's computer, which shows the force against me is 45 newtons. Meet the new aerodynamic low friction Femi. Go for it, Joss. is much better. Look at that airflow. The teardrop helmet helps smooth things along. 17 newtons, just over a third of the drag I started with. Time for a road test. Don't worry, Joss, I'll be back before you know it.
So for your test, you should know about the three different forces in action. Gravity is the force that acts on all masses and pulls towards the center of the Earth. Friction is the force that opposes movement. And air resistance is the force that opposes movement through air. So far, we've looked at forces acting on objects in straight lines, but forces can also be used to turn objects about a pivot. Now, if I try and unscrew this nut using a spanner, the spanner exerts a turning force on the nut. This turning force is called a moment. Now, if the moment is big enough, it will unscrew the nut. But if not, there are two ways of increasing the moment. First of all, we can increase the distance from the force to the pivot, get a longer handle spanner. So this time I'm applying the same force, but the distance from the force to the pivot is increased, giving a greater moment. Now if that doesn't work, I can go back to my shorter spanner and this time use both hands a greater force. The increased force also means a greater moment, and this time I think it's working. So the moment of a be described by this equation. Moment equals the force times the distance from the pivot. And the moment of a force can be measured in Newton centimeters or Newton meters. So if I exert a force of 70 Newtons and the distance from my hand to the pivot is 0.1 meters, we've got the information we need to work out the moment. So using our relationship, moment equals force times distance from the pivot, we have 70 newtons times 0.1 meters equals 7 newton meters. Let's look at another pivot, this time a seesaw. The pivot is at the center of the seesaw, and if we place an object on each end, they exert a moment about the pivot. And if these two moments are equal, then the seesaw is balanced. This is known as the principle of moments. So when balanced, the total clockwise moment equals the total anti-clockwise moment. So for moments, you need to know that the moment is the effectiveness of a force causing an object to turn about a pivot. A moment can be calculated by multiplying the force in newtons by the distance from the pivot. The principle of moments states that when an object resting on a pivot is balanced, the total clockwise moment equals the total anti-clockwise moment. So, if Kirk here weighs 250 newtons and is 2 metres away from the pivot, where must Ken, who weighs 300 newtons, sit in order for the seesaw to be balanced? Stop the tape and see if you can figure out. Let's have a look at how you would work out this problem. When balanced, the total clockwise moment equals the total anti-clockwise moment. Therefore, 250 newtons, Kirk's weight, times 2 metres, equals 300 newtons times the distance. Therefore, the distance needed for Ken is 250 times 2 divided by 300, which equals 1.6 metres. Ken has to sit 1.6 metres away from the pivot for the seesaw to be balanced. This brings us to the end of this unit on forces and motion. Before we move on, make sure you know all the different formulae needed for different calculations. If you can't remember all of them, why not rewind and go back over the key points? Check through this section in the Key Stage 3 book or on our website.